apologize first to you guys online that the screen is going to be a little washed out because it's so bright here. If you're like super zoomed. What? I, that's because I'm so close. I'll, I'll cut that. Um, so today we're going to talk about creation and, um, and what that looks like, what it teaches us about the nature of God. And the way this happened was Mike asked us to teach today, Lauren and I, and um, we had no idea what we were going to talk about like the middle of this week. And he kept texting, hey, I want to create a graphic, what am I going to do? Uh, and we didn't know. So like, I don't know, maybe Wednesday night, we're sitting out on the back deck, um, and our back deck just looks over fields. Um, did you, did you mention yeah. Yes, because yeah. that okay, cool. what's on the screen. <laughs> um, so it just looks over fields, and Lauren called me out. I was actually not outside. Lauren called me out, and there were literally like hundreds of thousands of fireballs. It was one of the most gorgeous things we'd ever seen, and we kind of sat there. It was like, I don't know, 15 minutes. We sat there. We didn't really even say much to each other. We are just watching, and um, it was awesome. It was just beautiful, and it, it clicked that night. I said, okay, the, the God that we serve, created the fireball. And I, I just, it blew, it blew our mind. We talked about it a little bit, and uh, we decided that's what we were going to talk about. Today. So what does creation reveal to us about the nature of God, um, the God who created fireflies? So I'm going to flip through these. Uh, hold on a second. We had the words up, but since it's just us and the coons and the gospels, we figured we didn't really need to flip through the words. So you're going to have a hard time seeing this, I apologize, but, but stick with me. What it is, it shows um, it shows like a bay, and there are jellyfish in this bay that light up, kind of like a firefly, and that's called bioluminescence. So that's the biochemical emission of light, living organisms such as fireflies and ocean creatures, um, they, can, they can emit. And it's to me, this, this whole idea of bioluminescence has always fascinated me. Like, what? How does that happen? How did that come to be? Like, at what point in the history of the Earth did these creatures start to do this? And you realize that something that complex and something that beautiful had to be designed. It just had to be designed by somebody. And uh, what are some other examples of times where, like, like, I've seen this. I've seen, I've been at the ocean, seen the bioluminescence, and it, like, took my breath away. What are some other things in nature that have, like, taken your breath away? And again, those of you online are going to need your participation because there's not many of us here. <laughs> what are some things you've been out in nature, in God's creation, and your breath didn't just let you because it was so overwhelming? Sunsets. What's that? Waterfalls, yeah. Sunsets. Sunsets. Cody said the Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah, great day. I've never been there. I would like to go. What else? Anything else? Ah, yes, the process of birth. The miracle of birth, right? The ocean. The ocean, yeah. That's Lauren said the ocean. That's like the only place she'd like to be all the time. So, yeah. Well, How God created that process where babies, baby puppies drink from their mothers. It's amazing, right? That's a really awesome. incredible thing. So, again, you're not going to be able to see this well, but this is a sunset over the bay. So just picture that with me. Jenny that said was, wildlife, yeah. Yeah, what's the, what was that? Jenny said wildlife. Wildlife, right. So the beauty of a sunset or other things in nature, just they, they cry out, this is who God is, right? Um the next thing I have up here is a thunderstorm, right? A thunderstorm shows the power of the God we serve. Um, it's just so powerful to think of something like that. This one, I don't know if you can see it. You probably can see that one a little better. That's a hummingbird. And I, I've always been fascinated by hummingbirds and the fact that those little itty bitty wings beat at 70 beats per second. It just it blows my mind. They can go forward and backward. And uh, watching hummingbirds, my grandparents loved to watch hummingbirds. They had feeders everywhere. And so I've always been fascinated by 
who created that? Who thought that up? And the last one here, you're going to have a hard time seeing it. This is a picture of Lauren I'm holding um, what? I'm going to share my screen. You guys share? Okay, cool. So this is a picture of Lauren holding uh, Devlin, and then the one on the right is me holding Regan. And the whole, the miracle of childbirth is, and, and just the beauty and innocence of a newborn baby, it's awesome. So, um, scripture, I think, is clear about this. The creation is supposed to speak to us about who God is and what he's like. So, if that's true, then let's take a look at what creation tells us. So this is Romans 1, 18 to 25, and I'm going to read this from the ESV. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So a few things I want to point out here. Uh, and we're going to come back to this a couple times, is where it says that it's plain to them, right? God has shown it to them, and that they are without excuse. And what that means is creation declares the glory of God. And so we all should know. We all should know who he is and, and learn about him from our creation. So what does creation say? Uh, I don't have time this morning to go into every single thing that creation says, right? I believe that it's so glorious that we could do that for a year and never touch the depth of it. But I'm going to zero in on a couple things here with you. And Lauren was supposed to do this with me, but instead she's handling the Zoom. So thank you, babe, for doing that. And I'm sharing the screen so they can see all of this really well. Oh, cool. You're sharing this screen? Yes. Oh, awesome. Baby, I'm a tech yeah, genius. Yeah, she is a tech wizard, guys. Like, I don't know <laughs> what I'm doing here. So I picked out five things. What does creation reveal about God's nature? And the first is God is glorified. God is loving. God is powerful. God is the source of all life. And the final one is Jesus has authority over his creation. So let's start with God is glorified. So this is Psalm 19, 1 to 6, and most of you will recognize this as the verse that starts out, the heavens declare the glory of God, okay? But I read it in the message while I was preparing this, the message version, and I just thought it was so cool and beautiful the way they put it, um, that I'm going to read this passage to you from the message, but just understand this is the law, the heavens declare the glory of God. So it says, God's glory is on tour in the skies. God craft on exhibit across the horizon. Madam Day holds classes every morning. Professor Knight lectures each evening. Their words are heard, their voices are recorded, but their silence fills the earth. Unspoken truth is everywhere. God makes a huge dome for the sun, a super dome. The morning sun's a new husband, leaping from his honeymoon bed. The daybreaking sun, an athlete racing to the tape. That's how God's word vaults across the skies from sunrise to sunset, melting ice, scorching deserts, and warming hearts to faith. I mean, the, the, the ESV version is awesome, but this to me, the message just, it pointed out his glory and how glorious he is from his creation and what we're supposed to learn from that. So the next one I picked out is this one, Psalm 96, 11 to 12. And this is coming from the ESV. It says, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exalt and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy. And I love these passages like this where it talks about creation actually rejoicing and singing and praising 
right? I love the verse where it talks about if we don't do it, the rocks will cry out because he deserves to be glorified, right? So um, I have a quote here from John Piper, and I thought this was so appropriate for what we're talking about this morning because I think the mistake we can make with creation is to let it become an idol, right? And whether that's because we don't honor the one who created it or we don't actually believe it was created. It's easy to make that an idol. So he says, if created things are seen and handled as gifts of God and as mirrors of his glory, they need not to be occasions by idolatry. If our delight is in them, in them, it's always also a delight in their being. Right? So we're saying, as we delight in these things, let's remember the giver of those gifts. So the next one is God is loving. And this is what I was going to have Lauren talk about because she's ten times more loving than I am. But um, since she said it like that, I will take care of it. But how does creation reveal God's love for us and for his creation? So I'm going to go to another psalm, 8, 1 to 6. And this is also from the message. It says, God, brilliant Lord, yours is a household name. Nursing infants gurgle choruses about you. Toddlers shout the songs that drown out the enemy talk and silence atheist babble. I look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous, your homemade sky jewelry, moon and stars mounted in their settings. Then I look at my micro self and wonder, why do you even bother with us? Why take a second to look our way? Yet we've so narrowly missed being gods. And, and that's the verse that talks about we're just below the heavenly uh, creation, right? So it says, yet we've so narrowly missed being gods, bright with Eden's dawn light. You put us in charge of your handcrafted world, repeated to us your Genesis charge, made us stewards of sheep and cattle, even animals out in the wild, birds flying and fish swimming, and whales singing in the ocean deep. So you have to you have to accept the fact that if God created all this, that it's important to Him, right? That He loves it. And, and in Genesis, and then again in this Psalm, it reminds us that we are to be stewards of that creation. And so, if He trusts us enough to do that, God must love us and love His creation. The next passage comes from Isaiah 43, 19 to 21. It says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people who I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. So this passage is talking about how not only do we take care of creation, but creation also takes care of us and provides for us. Um, and God provides those natural resources for us to thrive in this creation that he's made. Now, we're not always good at that, <laughs> but he has provided that for us. And, uh, and I just think it's beautiful how nature provides everything that we need to do on this earth. So the next one um, here is for the last one for God is loving comes from Matthew 6, 25 to 33. And um, this is again, a really familiar passage, but I'm going to read it for the message because I think it just, it gives us a fresh perspective on what it says. So yeah, under, right prior to this, Jesus is basically giving a choice of what you're going to do. So it starts out with him saying, if you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. This is the, uh, this is the whole sparrows of the air, flowers of the field passage. So you're, you're familiar with this, but I'm reading it in a different translation. There is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered. 
not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God. And you count far more to him than the birds. Has anyone by fussing in front of a mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion. Do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashion, walk into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The ten best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives so much attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can focus on God's giving. I just thought this was such a unique perspective on this passage that they have in the message. And again, this is the sparrows in the field, who can add an hour to his life, uh, the wildflowers are arrayed better than Solomon. So you're familiar with this passage, but I love how this talks about uh, so much time and money being wasted on worry. And uh, this last line where it says, let's not be so preoccupied with getting, let's focus on the giver of those gifts, right? He loves us. He provides for us through his creation. All right, the next thing is God is powerful. So his creation teaches us about the power of God and who he is. So let's look at that through scripture. Isaiah 40, 25 to 26 says, To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He will bring out their hosts by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. So there was a time long ago where they thought, scientists thought, uh, astronomers thought, there was like a thousand stars. There was debate if it was like a thousand five or a thousand fifty six or whatever. They thought there was like a thousand stars in the entire universe. Now we know it's more like, I forget, it's a lot of zero, 70 sextillion stars or something like that that we've been able to identify thanks to the Hubble telescope, etc. cetera. Um, and it's crazy because scripture tells us that he, he calls them by name. He knows their number and calls them by name. I mean, what type of God breathes stars into existence, right? He's so powerful. Danny Faulkner, who has a PhD in astronomy, uh, found this quote, and, and I just thought it was so uh, important to, to highlight what we're talking about. He says, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is a magnificent collection of a few hundred billion stars. But the Milky Way is just one of over a hundred billion galaxies. The total number of stars in the universe is staggering. We can't count the stars, but God can, and he calls them by name. This speaks to God's mighty power in creation. And like I said before, you know, if you've ever been in the middle of a thunderstorm, you know, watching it from your deck or your porch, or if you, um, you know, one of my managers here used to live in Florida, and, and I remember getting a picture from him one time of him paddling his kayak through St. Pete, Florida, because uh, because there was a hurricane that had come through. I mean, he is so powerful in his creation. All right, the next thing. God is the source of all life. And this is the one I'm going to spend the most time on, because I think it's important that we recognize creation as believers for what it is, and who created it, how it was accomplished, uh, Thing is very important. So if he's the source of all life, that means that all of this wasn't just some random accident. So important questions here is, and I pulled a lot of this from uh, a video series called The Truth Project, which Cliff Marley, you've done that with us. And, uh, it's, it's really a good, it's really a good uh, resource for asking some of these questions and answering them. So 
some things I thought of is why is there something rather than nothing? So if you picture in your mind, why is there something rather than nothing? Like at what point did the cosmos come into existence? Were they always here? Or did they have to be created? Was there a beginning, right? And if there was a beginning, say the Big Bang, where did those materials come from, right? Where did that power come from to make something like that happen? So why is there something rather than nothing? The next question I want to answer is, can life form spontaneously from non-living matter? In other words, can inert matter, given the right amount of time and chemicals and whatever, become life? Can, can life come from non-life? And then the third one, does nature reveal evidence of having been designed? Because if it's designed, and it, and it appears to be designed, right, then doesn't that stand to reason that there is a designer, a creator, right? So let's look at this. Job 12, 7 to 10 says, But ask the beasts, and they will teach you, the birds of the heavens, and they will tell you, or the bushes of the earth, and they will teach you, and the fish of the sea will declare to you, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. So this doesn't, this, if you believe scripture is the true holy word of God, this doesn't leave much room for interpretation, right? It's, it's clear that every living thing comes from him, his life, right? The life he gave it, and the breath of all mankind. So without that, without God's life-giving power, there would be no life, right? He is the source of all life. So in the book, um, The Origin of Life, George Wall says, most modern biologists, having reviewed with satisfaction the downfall of the spontaneous generation hypothesis. So let me pause here. The spontaneous generation hypothesis is that life can spring from non-life. That was what the, so scientists long ago speculated, right? And the reason they did that is, you know, they'd lay out a piece of raw meat, and suddenly maggots would spring forth from them. So they said, okay, life is springing from non-life. Now we know, of course, that the maggots are fly eggs that are laid in the raw meat. But back then they didn't know that. But now we do. So George Wald is saying, so now that the downfall of the spontaneous generation hypothesis has come, and we know it's not true, it's literally impossible. Yet unwilling to accept the alternative belief in special creation, they're left with nothing. I think a scientist has no choice but to approach the origin of life through a hypothesis of spontaneous generation. Okay, understand what's happening here. He's saying, I know the downfall of spontaneous generation has happened. I know it's impossible, but I'm not willing to accept the creation theory. So, I think a scientist has no choice but to approach it with the hypothesis of spontaneous generation, even though we know it's impossible. One has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task to conceive spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Yet here we are, as a result, I believe in spontaneous generation. So this scientist is saying, I know, I know it's impossible. We know, as a scientific community, it's impossible. But I'm not willing to believe that there is a divine creator. So even though it's impossible, I believe that life can spring from non-life. And they say that our faith doesn't stand on it. I mean, that takes a lot of faith to make that statement, doesn't it? A lot of faith in something you know not to be true. So this is Francis Crick. He is the co-discoverer of DNA. And he says this. These... These are brilliant people. It blows my mind that they can play these mental gymnastics with themselves. So listen to this. An honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have had to be satisfied to get it going. Okay? But, Unwilling to accept that, Francis Crick 
came up with a different theory. He said, so because that's impossible, the directed panspermia theory came into being. This is his theory. It is the theory that the first living cell must have been transported to Earth from some other planet outside the solar system. So we're not willing to believe that there is a creative, divine God who created all this, but instead we're going to say it was aliens. Right? It was aliens. And, and okay, is it impossible that, that aliens... You know, uh, brought the first living cell to Earth? I guess not. But then, what would your question be? That Who brought the aliens? Who brought the aliens, <laughs> right? Where did the aliens come from? So what they're attempting to do here is to push it off with enough distance and enough time to say, well, I know it's impossible here, but maybe it was possible somewhere else. So aliens brought life to Earth. It's pretty crazy, though. So I'm going to revisit uh, Romans 1, 18 to 25. And I won't read the whole thing. Remember, it's, you know, it's plain to them because God showed it to them. The heavens reveal the glory of God. Let's look at that last sequence again here. It says, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Okay? So I want you to remember... Romans was written a long time ago, way before Darwin, way before Dawkins, way before Crick, right? It was written then. And, and Paul is telling us that these people are going to exchange the glory of God for images, keep that in mind, images of mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. So let's think about the cornerstones of the Darwinian theory, the, the uh, evolution theory. You guys see that? They exchanged the immortal God for images of birds and mortal men and creeping things. See what's happened here? It's exactly what they've done. So we have the, the famous picture of... Uh, evolution from an ape into a, a, a man. And I'm not going to get into all the details of that, but it's that is one of the cornerstones. The embryos, right, which we know are now fraudulent. Um, that's been proven that it was a fraudulent thing. But that was one of the cornerstones. The one on the bottom right is in a horse's foot, and how a horse went from having toes to having hoops, right? Okay? The one, and the one beside that is Darwin's famous finches. So he speculated that because finch beaks change size with the season, um, that that is a sign of evolution, right? So the first two, the embryos and the uh, the ape to man, we we can we know that we can throw that out, right? We know that the embryos were faked. We we understand as we read scripture where human life came from. The other two I want to address. But the, those are those are both evolution within a species, if that makes sense. So Darwin's theory on evolution was that a dog, and with enough time and uh, the right conditions, a dog can become a, a cat or whatever, right? A species can change into another species. There's never been any proof of that. However, we do believe, even as Christian scientists, that evolution can happen within a species, right? So if the conditions are better for a finch to have a big beak to survive, those finches are going to have offspring, and that's why the, the finch beaks change size. The same with the horse feet. Um, but again, the important thing here is understanding that Paul predicted this long ago, that the glory of God would be exchanged for images. Back in the 1800s, uh, I'll let, I'll let the, I'm going to play a video about William Paley. And um, I'm just going to let Dr. Tackett, who, who did this video, sort of tell the story. Uh, so stick with me. It's, we might it's just be able to minutes. listen. Sorry. What's that? The, our Zoom friends might just be listening a little bit more. Well, they can. Can they zoom in on the screen? I can try. Yeah. All right. So listen to this as he talks about an argument for design. How is this possible? Was it a touchdown? 
or was it not? Now, I was watching it, and I saw for certain that it was incomplete. <laughs> the referees called it good, but they obviously missed the call. How is it that thousands of people immediately saw the same thing, but concluded a different truth claim from it? Interesting, is it not? Well, what happens is that man has a tendency to see his own position. We need to be careful as well as Christians that we don't simply just see what we want to see. Because quite frankly, folks, in this area of science, the data is pouring in. The deeper we look into space, the more close we look into the cell and everything else, the more we see and hear the heavens declare the glory of God. You and I do not need to be afraid to look into a telescope. We do not need to be afraid to look into the microscope. Because the evidence supports the truth of God. In fact, the more it pours in, the more there is developing a deep, troubling sense by those who see the universe as nothing but just a box. Now, there was a man who wrote a book in the 1800s, and his name was William Paley. An incredible man. And his book is titled Natural Theology, or Evidences of the Existence and Attributes of the Deity Collected from the Appearances of Nature. That's when titles were very long. But William Paley, in this book, spoke of an interesting opening scenario. And it goes something like this. He says, suppose a man was walking through the moors, let's say forest, and his foot happened to dislodge an object. He picked up the object and he began to examine it. And he noticed when he pushed the little thing here that the lid opened up. And inside he began to notice that there were numbers and a little small hand and a larger hand. And, and when he put it to his ear, he heard a ticking sound. And the more he observed, he began to realize that it, it somehow kept time with the morning and the evening and the days. Now, William Paley said no one in their right mind would look at this and say, my goodness, look what the pine sap and the pine straw and, and the freezing and the thawing and the cold and the wind and maybe a little squirrel fur here or there have produced an amazing thing, don't you think? And Paley says no one would think that. Why? Because it is obvious to us that this is a pocket watch and it has been created by a watchmaker. It was called, and is still called, Paley's Argument for Design. Well, there was another book, you fast forward now, uh, 200 years approximately, and there is now a book written by Richard Dawkins, entitled The Blind Watchmaker. Dawkins is attempting to refute the old argument of Paley which for years was put in the dustbin, but now because of the evidence is being revised. And so in his book called The Blind Watchmaker, he says this, natural selection, the blind unconscious automatic processes which Darwin discovered and which we now know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of life has no purpose in mind. It has no mind and no mind's eye. It does not plan for the future. It has no vision, no foresight, no sight at all. If it can be said to play the role of watchmaker in nature, it is the blind watchmaker. Now, this is interesting because we are now coming to the point 
where it is getting more difficult to cover our ears, to close our eyes to this noisy universe. Look at this statement by Dawkins. He says, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Do you understand what he's saying? I know it looks designed. I know it looks like it had a purpose, but it doesn't. Interesting statement. Now, Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA, brilliant man. Biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. Can you imagine this? A student in Dr. Crick's class. Dr. Crick is saying, repeat after me. It was not designed. It was not designed. It was not designed. Why do you have to do that? Because it looks designed. Can you imagine if the forensic investigator or the insurance investigator coming upon the scene and saying, boy, it sure looks like arson to me, but <laughs> no, we can't accept that argument. Oh, sure looks to me like this guy was murdered, but no, we can't accept that. It has to be an accident. Do you understand what is happening here? The evidence points that someone started the fire. The evidence points that someone had a hand in this murder, but we will turn a blind eye to it. Why? Because we've shut ourselves off of anything outside the box. And so Dawkins and Crick and others are now in the mode of having trying to convince us to say, look, repeat after me, it was not designed. It just appears that way. Well, you know what? It's really kind of silly, is it not? I don't know how many of you have driven by Mount Rushmore, but I guarantee you, people don't drive by Mount Rushmore and say, hey kids, look, look what the rain and the snow and the wind have done to this mountain here. Well, by golly, that looks a little like George Washington. And what a coincidence right next to him is, is something that looks a little like Thomas Jefferson. No one would do that. How is it that we know that when we walk along the ground and someone discovers an arrowhead, that it's not just a weird looking rock? We recognize design. It is obvious to us. In fact, it is plain to us. Why do we turn away from it? Charles Darwin said, I remember well the time when the thought of the eye made me cold all over. Why do you suppose the thought of the eye made Darwin cold all over? Because it doesn't work. It doesn't fit. There is so much incredible design within the eye. He says, but I've got over the stage of the complaint. And now small trifling particulars of structure often make me very uncomfortable. The sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. Why did a peacock's feather make Darwin sick? Why do you suppose, Jay? It's like someone actually designed it. How did the peacock somehow Create this feather with what looks like an eye on it. Oh, the heavens declare the glory of God. All you have to do is look. All you have to do is look because it is plain to us. Not that anybody can see it, but I'm going to pull this back up anyway. You can. I meant here. Oh. <laughs> I know, you guys online, you, you got it good today. So, going along with that video, which I just find fascinating, I, I know it's nine minutes, and, and I apologize for being so long, but I think it's important. 
Because it depends on, as he said at the beginning, we tend to see our own position, right? And you will look at everything through a lens of that position. So it's important that we don't do that. Kepler said, long time ago, Kepler was ancient science, right? He said, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order and harmony which has been imposed on it by God. Okay? So this is a scientist long ago. And he's coming at it from the perspective of, and, and most scientists that, at that time were creationists, right? So that they basically saw science as the study of what God has created and the laws he imposed upon that and, and the order. If you look at the complexity and the order of our, of our solar system and, and universe, it's amazing, right, how it works. Why do we have tides and all that stuff here on Earth? Why, why doesn't the ocean just flood the Earth? Right? Um, so that's kind of the macro. And then, and then looking at the complexity of the, the cells in your body and the amazing mechanisms that happen within the cells, I encourage you to, to, to study this and look at how complex the cell is. And can you imagine the, the design that had to go in making just one cell work, right? What had to happen if you believe in the primordial goo and the chemicals that you know somehow lightning struck it and light came from non-light? It's craziness when you really think about it. But if you believe in that, how did the cell? How did it go from that that cell to this incredible complexity that we see around us and the order within our bodies and why they work, right? So uh, Stuart Burgess, who is a mechanical engineer at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom, uh, so this is a modern scientist now. He says, when designing robots, I'm reminded that engineers could never emulate the integration found in the human body. Take, for example, the blood circulation system. An adult has over 60,000 miles of blood vessels that weave around every part of the body. The placement of those vessels is so accurate that every one of the body's trillions of cells is no more than a fraction of a millimeter from a blood vessel. Such awesome design shows that God is infinite in understanding and knowledge. He is the source of all life. We can't recreate it. Random processes couldn't have created it. We recognize design, as Dr. Taggart said, it is plain to us. We recognize when something has been designed. So the last one, um, most of what I pulled from was from the Old Testament. I want to show here that Jesus is the one that has authority over creation. He was there in the beginning, right? He will always be there. So we tie this back to Jesus and who he is. What does it tell us about what the Father has given to Jesus in terms of authority over creation? Colossians 1, 15 to 20 says, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him. That's important, right? We don't see, we don't rec we see him in the Old Testament. We don't recognize him in the Old Testament often. So it's telling us all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is not, or and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him everything might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Okay? Understand what's happening here in this passage. It says, God was pleased to let Jesus, to let all things reconcile through him. That what that means? Jesus literally, scientists can't tell yet. They don't understand what holds our cells together. Right? There, there's a debate, there's a, a search for this. We don't know yet. But the scriptures tell us that, right, that he holds all things together. Okay? It's, it's not a mystery to us why our cells are held together. 
one of my favorite stories, showing that Jesus has authority over creation. And you'll recognize the story. Mark 4, 35-41. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go to the other side. He's talking about the, the sea of, I forget, Galilee, maybe, I don't remember. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in a boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. It says asleep on a cushion. So he curled up in this storm, Jesus did fell asleep. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Hey, we're dying here. Like, can you wake up? Do something? You know, at least lend a hand. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey? Scripture is clear to us who has authority over creation. And that's the Son, that's Jesus. And that should be a comfort to us. And I'll end with this. In Revelation, this is the end of Scripture, right? Um, it says, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and light forever and ever. To me, when I read this, it tells me that creation looks to Jesus. Right? He is the author of creation. Uh, and they honor him. So Jesus has authority over all creation. So just to review, because I'm a teacher, forgive me, I know Mike's style is a little different, but um, creation tells us that God is glorified, God is loving, God is powerful, that he's the source of all life, and that Jesus has authority over all creation. Um, it tells us a lot more than that, and I encourage you to, to go on your own exploration of what creation tells you. But I think scripture is pretty clear that all these things are true. So God, we just we thank you for your creation, for your creativity. We thank you for um, the resources you've provided for your creation and the fact that we get to be part of it and be stewards over it, that you trusted us with that task. So, um, the heavens really do declare the glory of God. And it, it is difficult when you when you actually look into it, when you actually study it for yourself, it's difficult to look at it and say, this, this is all an accident. We know it wasn't, God. We thank you for your foresight and for your love, for your power that brought creation into existence. And you created each one of us. And that's what Lauren was going to talk about, is how uh, each of you are part of that creation. And God, we thank you for that. Uh, we thank you for allowing us be part of that creation, and we know that we know that the world is a broken place because of sin, and we look forward to the day where you create a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem that will be perfect, and uh, we will we will see one another there and see our loved ones. So we thank you for this small glimpse through creation of what heaven is going to be like. In your name we pray. You guys want to? You don't have to sing. We're good. All right. Thank you, guys. And thank you to the four of you that are sitting here, five of you, uh, for being here.